Good morning, church. We are so glad that you were able to join us today for our online worship service. If you haven't done so already, please take a minute to check in and let us know that you were here. You can do this by clicking on the Welcome tab within the online church platform. The giving and digital bulletin links can also be found within the online church platform. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the links in the description below. Our worship service will begin right after this video. Welcome to the New Cumberland First Church of God. I'm Pastor Charlie Zahor. It's good to have you here with us this morning. And um, I appreciate, you know, that you guys are adhering to our safe spacing pretty well and uh, mostly wearing masks on the way in and, and the way out. Even though you may not believe in masks, other people do. And um, I, I appreciate the respectfulness in that. Uh, I'm going to talk about masks in a little bit before my sermon. We have some free books we're giving away. If you, They are free. All we ask is that you will read it. It is titled, Tell Someone You Can Share the Good News by Greg Laurie. Greg Laurie is an excellent writer. Um, some of these books are laying around on the radiator by the offering bucket over there. By on the radiator on the offering bucket, or next to the, on the radiator on that side. And out in the hallways, the windowsill, if you go out the main entryway, there are a couple. And at the ramp entrance, a couple. If you want one and don't get one, I have more in my office. Uh, those are all the announcements I have, so at this time I will turn it over to our worship leader, Gail. This morning we're going to start off with a song called Peace. Um, you know, peace is something that we all need every day, but there are certainly days where we need even more. And the Lord tells us in his word in John chapter 16, verse 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. And in Colossians chapter 3, verse, t verse 15, it says, And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. And then, of course, I think most of us know, and this is right in the song, um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So let's stand and worship him this morning.
hear my heart, and I trust that the Holy Spirit intercedes at those times. Help us to rest. Help us to rest in your peace, knowing that you are always with us. Love us more than we could ever comprehend. We praise you, Lord, for all that you are and all that you do. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture is not going to be on screen. It usually is, but it's not going to be today. And I really want to focus on getting us back into the Word. For our online audience, go and get your Bibles. If they're not in front of you right now, I'll wait. So while I'm waiting for people to get their Bibles, I I want to talk to you about masks a little bit. I know they're a little bit controversial. I'm not going to get into that. But I care about you. We provide masks at both of our entry doors that we're using and in some other places in the church. And um, I carry one with me and wear it when I walk around some of the time if people are around. Um, But here's something that's important. This type of mask is not intended for you to wear every day without changing it. And if you're wearing a cloth mask, you're not supposed to keep wearing them each day without washing them because what happens is as you're breathing out, there's moisture in your air and there are germs in your air. Bacteria will grow in these masks and you won't even be able to see it. And people are having respiratory problems because they keep using the same mask that wasn't meant to be reused like this. This is a disposable mask. So for your safety, don't keep using these masks. Throw them out. I mean, you know, be smart about it. If you put it on for, you know, a minute or something, yeah, maybe you could reuse it. Now, all of that said, I'm not a doctor or anything medical. I barely passed, you know, graduated from high school. So use your judgment. You're smart. But we are here to talk about God's Word. So let me open with prayer. Almighty God, uh, the the message I'm going to give today, uh, I just beg you to own it. Speak through my voice. And if I am planning to say anything that is not proper or appropriate in your eyes, purge it out of my mind and take it from my lips. Change my mind about what I will say. Because, Lord, we want to hear what you have to say. We invoke your Holy Spirit into this place. You are welcome here. Speak directly into the minds and the hearts of everybody listening to my voice, everybody that is looking at your words in Scripture today or hearing me read them. We want to know the truth as you proclaim it, not as we think it might be. And today's passage that I'm going to be reading is is confusing, and people believe different things with it. So I ask that you will speak this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So I am going to be talking about something. It is known in, the, in Christian circles as the Olivet Discourse that Jesus gave. Um, you can find it. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 24 primarily. Uh, the Olivet Discourse goes through chapter 25. And if you read through it, it's very fascinating. I know we, we spent a lot of time recently in the Sermon on the Mount. Great stuff. The Olivet Discourse is quite different than that. Uh, especially if you go back and read chapter 23. I know some of you read chapters 23 and 24 before you came here. And 23, Jesus is very harsh on religious leaders. But when we look at chapter 24, Jesus is getting into some um, teaching about future events. We would call it prophecy. And his purpose in talking about future events wasn't to satisfy our curiosity or even answer our questions Uh, because they're largely speculative. His purpose was to protect and to guide us and to instruct us. Jesus gave very little attention to the when when will the end times come, and he focused more on how shall we live as we're waiting for the end times to come. So today's passage talks some about end times, but it is largely prophetic. So... uh, Turn with me to chapter 24 of Matthew, and we're just going to keep that up. So, (laughs) what if, you know, what if what we are living right now is the onset of the end? What if it is only really a few years away? How would that affect us? Well, let's look at Scripture. Chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple. And I'm going to stop right there for a moment. 
and go back to chapter 23 because chapter 23 kind of puts chapter 24 into a framework to help us to understand it. So I'll tell you what chapter 23 has. I know, you know many, or several of you don't have Bibles open or you, you didn't bring your Bible with you, and that's fine. But in chapter 23, Jesus is really calling out the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and on at least six different occasions in this one chapter, he calls them hypocrites because they are teaching and they are not living even up to the standards that they are teaching. And you know, if you're a regular here, you, you hear me say, you know, I'm a hypocrite because I have to teach things that I am not able to live up to because I am still a sinner. And I freely admit that I am a hypocrite. I try to reduce that. I try to help other people and try not to be a Pharisee. I'm sure sometimes I fail in that regard, but I've made deliberate decisions on how I will pastor, teach, and serve because of Jesus' teachings about how the Pharisees did it so badly. Um, you know, they were looking down on people, kind of like me up here. I'm looking down on you know, most of the people here. And it wasn't a physical thing. It was a mental and a heart issue. They felt that they were better than, than us everyday people. You know, we don't have an altar rail separating clergy from laity. I am just like every one of you, just God has called me to serve in this role. And he's called each of you to serve in different roles. But Jesus calls these religious leaders at one point blind guides in verse 24. He compares them. He says, you're like whitewashed tombs. You know, you look great, but you're a grave marker for a dead person. Jesus is very harsh on the religious leaders, so I want to be careful about that. Um, and let me read to you in chapter 23, verse 37, to the end of that chapter. As Jesus is leaving, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now think about that last phrase Jesus used. He says, you won't see me again until you are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus leaves the temple, and he leaves Jerusalem, and he will return on what we know as Palm Sunday. And on Palm Sunday, when he comes in, he's on a donkey, and the people are all gathered around, and what are they doing? They're waving palm branches, shouting, Hosanna, which means victory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they're shouting. You know, blessed is the son of David. And they're recognizing Jesus as the Messiah as he is coming into Jerusalem. And things change, of course. We know, most of us know the rest of the story. But this is kind of prophetic of Jesus. And Jesus, uh, in, in Scripture, especially when Jesus is talking, so often he's talking on multiple levels. And we like to focus on one of those levels. Usually he's talking about the present. And he's talking about the future. And in many cases, he's talking about the far off future, things that have yet to occur. And we're going to see that if I ever get to it today. If not, come back next Sunday. So um, what are we, four words into the chapter. Jesus left the temple. Let me continue reading. Um, and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked. This is Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So just think, if you were one of Jesus' apostles, you're, you're leaving the temple, and it's in, this incredible thing, probably the thing on earth that you are most proud of because you're Jew, and like this is the temple, not just a synagogue somewhere else. This is the temple. Like, this is where God lives. And here you have Jesus, who you're following. He's your teacher, your guide. And he's saying, all of this is going to be torn down. I mean, look at this building here. This is nothing compared to the temple, right? I mean, this building's nothing. And, and Jesus is pointing at something far greater than this, saying, look, not two stones will be left unturned. This is going to be destroyed. And it's amazing, uh, as we continue reading, and he... I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. And he says, this is going to happen in this generation. And they must have been thinking, imagine what you would have been thinking. I don't want to put words into their minds, but if Jesus said that, it would have been really hard to understand. 
Let's continue reading in verse 4. Is that where I'm at? Oh, no, in verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, he, Jesus does, it's, it's interesting, as you read through this, he talks a lot without giving an answer, but he eventually gets to his answer. So if you jump ahead to verses, I'm going to go to verse 34. His answer is in verse 36, I believe. So in chapter 24, verse 34, I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And in verse 36, no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So Jesus actually gives them the answer. He doesn't know. You know, sometimes when you're asking people questions and they don't know the answer, they talk, you know, we're getting into the presidential primaries and all that stuff, right? You're going to hear a lot of answers to questions that don't answer the question. If they have debates, I don't know what's going on with that. I don't, I'm barely following politics at this point. Uh, so Jesus does answer their question, and I'm sure it wasn't a satisfying answer because we want to know specifics. Well, when is this going to happen? You know, we're into year 2020. Is it going to be? Is it going to be in my lifetime? You know, I'm, now I'm talking about the second coming of Christ. And he says, this generation, as I just said, will not pass away until this happens. Now he's referring to what he just said. These buildings are going to be torn down. And think about this, Jesus, this is really right before he was arrested and taken to the cross and resurrected from the dead. So it probably would have been around 30 A.D. Jesus died around the age of 33. So around 30 A.D., a generation is roughly 40 years. When was Jewish Jerusalem attacked and when was the temple tore down? It was 70 A.D., but Jesus is saying, look, in your generation, it's 30 A.D., a generation is 40 years, so we get to 70 A.D., and Jesus' words are fulfilled. The temple is tore down. And it's interesting to research this, and you guys have, if you have access to the internet, you know, just go in there and Google questions, look for good websites that seem to make sense, um, and read up on this stuff. It's fascinating. Or, you know, get a book, you know, the library. I, I get a lot of audio books on CD from the library. I listen as I'm driving. So here's what happened. Let me give you the context of, of the temple being torn down. In 66 AD, Nero is appointed uh, the counselor or the ruler of, of the Roman Empire, right? And Nero was a cruel and corrupt and harsh leader. Uh, there is a good case that in Revelation where it talks about the number 666, it is talking about Nero or Caesar Nero. There's a mathematical, if you take his name in Latin, it, it somehow translates to the number 666. You could research that. It's easy to find. I just don't want to go down that rabbit trail too far. So the Jews rebel because they were being abused and this Nero is a horrible ruler and Rome attacks Jerusalem and, of course, they go in there and they tear down, they steal the, the silver and the gold and they tear down the temple and it's destroyed. And as Jesus is talking about this happening, he's giving a foreshadowing. He's talking about this real event that happened now for us. And this is where I love this stuff because Jesus is saying it prophetically. Now, we're 2,000 years later and for us it's history. It is proven accurate. You know, you talk about the accuracy of the Bible. This is one of those cases like, he said it. And almost to the year, 40 years later, it happened. And he said, in this generation, 40 years, boom, prophecy fulfilled. And for us, it's history. But what Jesus often does, and the Bible does, it has multiple meanings. Jesus is saying, look, this stuff is going to happen. And it did happen but he's foreshadowing the temple being destroyed and you know Caesar Nero. It's a foreshadowing of what is yet to come in what we would call the end times. So for us, there still is prophecy to be fulfilled. And let me just tell you, I am not a prophecy expert. Some of you may know prophecy better. So I 
try not to get into things that are too specific that are questionable, but if you read different theologians and Bible experts, they have different opinions on some of this stuff. So uh, I try to keep it more mainline in general, but uh, you know, with prophecy, some of it isn't crystal clear. Um, just bear that in mind. But so I'm trying to tell you the stuff that is crystal clear. So where am I at here? Let me, let me read a little further. Am I at verse 4? Anyway, regardless, let's start at verse 4. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You know, this just made sense to me. As I read this and reread this, I came in a couple hours early this morning to reread it and try to figure stuff out. Like, have you heard anybody say, hey, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah, like, I don't see Donald Trump doing that. Maybe you can pull something from something he said. Or I didn't see Barack Obama doing that or Hillary Clinton. Or go, go back. Or you know, I don't see a world leader saying, I am the Christ. I am the Son of God. But you know who did and was treated that way? Caesar. Caesar. What did they say? Hail Caesar. They treated, treated Caesar as a god. In fact, Caesar probably demanded to be treated as a god. And I'm speculating a little bit now because I didn't research this because it just hit me now as I'm reading this. Yeah, Caesar and the Romans, you know, when they were coming into the temple, they were bringing their idol worship and they were very big into idol worship and worshiping Caesar. Anyway, let me continue reading. I don't want to go down that rabbit trail too far without researching deeper into it. Um, good stuff, though. Verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation. We get that, right? There are wars. And kingdom against kingdom. Think about this, though. Why is he saying nations and then he's saying kingdoms? Generally, I would say, well, they're basically the same thing. But if you think about the religious systems in the world, and I'm told there are more than 3,000 different religions. I don't know what the number is. But think about the three major religions in the world. You have Christianity, you have Judaism, and you have Islam. Now, Christianity and Judaism are very close. We have a distinct difference. But the Jews will be brought back into the fold when everything, you know, they will be brought back. So Christians and Jews have a very common thing, and it's related to the Messiah, we recognize Jesus as the Messiah who came. They are waiting for the Messiah to come. So we are waiting for Jesus to return. They are waiting for the Messiah to come. But they will be brought back in. So anyway, I'm lumping Judaism and Christianity together for a purpose here because the third major religion in the world, Islam, does not recognize Jesus, does not recognize the Messiah so is there a battle going on between Islam, Muslims, and Jews? Is there a battle going on between Islam and Christianity? There seems to be. There seems to be. And not everybody is radical and violent. I get that. But there is a real disconnect between one of the major religions and the other two. So I would say maybe that's what Jesus was referring to. Kingdom will rise against kingdom. And there have been war, religious wars. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. And what we are experiencing now, I would say, are birth pains. Because Jesus, as you know, we're getting closer to his return. And this stuff will happen more and more and more. And we, if you look anywhere in the world, there's all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, we've got the coronavirus, this pandemic, you have racial unrest, you have California's on fire, California's always on fire. You know, we were in Australia in February, it was on fire, and you know, and we don't really pay attention to a lot of world news anymore. Um, maybe you do, um, but we as Americans are kind of, we wear a lot of blinders. Even our news doesn't show as much world news as it used to. There are studies about that. Um, but anyway, so these things that we would call birthing pains, if you ever gave birth, and I can't speak from firsthand experience here, obviously, but you go into labor, and the labor pains start out, right, they're, and ladies, forgive me, they're not horrible at the onset, 
and they're, fur, they're far apart. And as you go further and further into the delivery of the baby, they get closer and harder, right? And I'm not going to use graphic terms, but when you're very close to delivery, the birthing pains are very close to each other and they're very difficult. And that is, I think, what we will see. And things are getting more difficult and maybe things are getting closer together. Um, it seems to be the case, but it's going to get worse as we get closer to Christ's return. And there will be a point where the church, I believe, will be raptured out of here and then it will get really bad, but I'm not going to get into that today too much. So let's go to verse um, 9. <laughs> Sorry, i got to get away from my numbers to read them a little bit. It said, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all the nations because of me. And this is the one thing I look at and say, well, this really hasn't happened. In the United States, Christians right now aren't hated by the world, aren't hated by our government and people that aren't Christians. But man, you could certainly see it coming, can't you? I think, boy, things change so quickly, even in this country. I think it will turn quickly, but I don't know when. Verse 10 at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And, th and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So these words, don't they ring like, wow? Yeah, the love of many will grow cold. Many will turn from the faith. You know, in the United States, I think the Christian faith isn't necessarily shrinking. Now I'm looking at, say, a, a 10 window, a 10 year frame, time frame. But it's not growing and our country is growing. So we are becoming a smaller percentage of the population. And many people are turning away from the faith, particularly younger people as they graduate from high school and head into that next era part of their life. Many are turning away from the faith. You know, studies are now, when you fill out surveys and they ask questions, what is your religion? You know, none of the above is becoming more and more common. In fact, they call the people that do that the nuns. The nuns in our society with no religious affiliation is a large, is a group that is growing rapidly. Of course, you're probably aware of that as you watch our culture. But these words that Jesus uses, the love of most will grow cold. I'm going to go back to chapter 23, verse 23. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the, of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Listen to this. So, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. So, legalistically, I can give a tithe. Yeah, I'm okay with giving a tithe. But Jesus takes it to this next level, which is really based on love. And he says, you are neglecting these, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And he said, you should have practiced the former without neglecting the latter or something like that. What Jesus is saying, don't be legalistic. Yeah, you can give a tithe, but you can hate your brother. And you could think you're good. You know, I'm very generous. I give 10% and more of my income to the works of God. You know, and then Sarah cuts me. I, you should got to quit sitting there. You're such an easy target. You know, and then Sarah cuts me off or doesn't let me go in traffic and I'm, and I'm cursing her. Like, what is wrong with you, you idiot, you fool? And then we go back to the teaching of Jesus. He says, if you say raka to her brother or you fool, you are in the dangers of hell. And this is, you know, what so many of us are embracing. You know what? I could, I could be a generous person. I'm a good person. But boy, I can sure neglect some of the other teachings of Jesus that he says are that important that they might send me to hell. Because if I'm calling her a fool, is there any chance that I love her as a sister? Now, if it's Sarah, obviously I wouldn't say that, right? But it's somebody I don't know. And Jesus says, love even your enemies. And it's easy for us to turn away from those things. But he's, it's important that we maintain a sense of justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Verse 15. 
So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Now, who is the reader? Well, right now I'm reading it. You might be reading it. Let the reader understand. Now, this is where we have to pay attention and use some insight and some intellect and not jump to our own conclusions, the things that we might want this to mean. Let the reader understand. Then that those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. And this is really where Jesus is talking about the invasion of the Romans on Jerusalem that I talked about just a little bit ago. When they came, Jesus says, get out. Jesus gave a warning really to Christians and to the Jews. When you are being attacked by the Romans, you won't stand a chance fighting them. Run! And if you research this, there was a specific town that most of them went to. I don't know what it was called. It's some town that I don't, didn't recognize the name of. Get out. You know, don't waste your time getting your stuff. Yeah, I want to get my stuff, right? Let me, no, wait, let me, like if your house was on fire, what would you grab? Well, the, the photographs and maybe the pets or, you know, your, whatever you value. And Jesus is saying, don't, don't waste your time getting that valuable stuff. Okay, maybe the pets, all right. I don't know how, but, you know, don't, like me, I'm thinking about my guns, like my dad gave me this, his old deer rifle, okay, now I got to find the key that's hidden, I got to open this thing, I got to figure out which one it is, and don't take time to do that, leave it, because your life is on the line, you are under attack, and Jesus said, this was going to happen, the place is going to be destroyed. On a footnote, a friend of mine, his house was on fire, and the dog was in the house, and they couldn't get the dog out, you know what they did? They went to the front door and rang the doorbell. And the dog ran to the front door. (laughs) Pretty smart. Anyway, let's jump over to verse 30 in chapter 24. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. So now we are seeing Jesus moving forward, I I believe, to end times prophecy. You know, crap has hit the fan, and I know I'm skipping some text. Read that on your own. Again, don't, don't even trust what I'm saying to you. Study it yourself. Listen to what I say as one of the sources of information that you have. But study this. And Jesus says, Now learn the lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Jesus is saying, There will be signs of the end times coming. And he continues on with this. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near. Right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away. I read this already. Until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But let's continue reading. No one knows about that hour, that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered, entered into the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And what Jesus is saying here is there will be signs and you can choose to ignore them. In the day of Noah, Noah spent all this time building an ark and it had never even rained. And the people all saw this. And then all of a sudden these animals start showing up two by two or more. And they didn't care. They didn't notice. They didn't time take time to figure it out, is this guy right? Is something coming? But more importantly for us now, is Jesus saying the same thing is going to happen for us. You will see all these signs. And if you don't think what we're seeing in our world right now are any of these signs, you know, that's on you. It seems to me like they are. I think there are some things that still need to happen uh, from a prophetic perspective. But I believe God is being patient and holding back. Verse 39, um, And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. 
Two women will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. This last part, there are significantly different opinions on what Jesus meant here. You know, with two men in the field, one will be taken, the other left behind. I think on a surface level reading, you would say he's talking about the rapture. Two will be in the field. The one that is righteous, that loves Jesus Christ, will be raptured out. Many studied theologians will say that is not what he is talking about here. If you read this in its full context, they say that can't be what he's talking about. Uh, some of them, many of them would say what he's talking about here is two people will be in the field and one, the corrupt one, the sinner, will be taken for judgment. But I would say there's a third possibility here in that um, if you think about after the rapture occurs and Christians are taken, there will still be people who believe that they are Christians here. And if you keep reading, I think you'll see where Jesus, you know, people are doing miracles in Jesus' name and casting out demons. They obviously believe that they are Christians. And Jesus says, away from me, you evil doers. I never knew you. But they believe that they are Christians. So you have two men working out in the field. If I'm one, I believe that I'm a Christian, but I'm really not because I haven't surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. It could be that I am taken to be persecuted. So let's just say there is wicked in the world and Christians have crossed all this turmoil. We've been persecuted and here's one, another one of these Christians. So I'm the Christian and I'm with a non-Christian and they take me to be persecuted. So there are three different possible meanings I just gave you there. I'm sure there are others if you read enough about this. Um, so I can't tell you which one is right. I, I don't know. As I said, when you read about end times, it's confusing sometimes, and it's ob sometimes not obviously clear. And in this case, experts disagree on what they think is actually happening there, which is pretty common. Theologians often disagree on things. But what we need to know, and what we need to apply to our lives from this, is we need to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ if we want to be with Him for all of eternity. And however we get there, we don't know. Will I be here when Jesus returns? Will I be raptured out? Will I be persecuted? I don't know the answer to any of those things. But I know this. In our country, things change. In a matter of days, things change like that. Something that is honored one day is disgraced the next day. And you, you see it happening. Whether you're liberal, conservative, politically, it doesn't matter. Whether you're liberal, conservative, religiously, it doesn't matter. Things are changing quickly. And Jesus told us they will. And it's not going to change for the better. The world is going to turn and continue to grow in evil. But we can turn to the one who is the author of life, who has given us the promise of eternal life. And if you want that in your life, if you never given, have given your life to Jesus, if you never call on Jesus and say, I believe and I receive you as Lord of my life and Savior, but I want to emphasize the Lordship of Jesus because when you say you are Lord of my life, it means you are my master Tell me what to do and I will do it. Let's pray. Almighty God, as we gather here, I'm again a sinner telling sinners about your righteousness. You are the one who is good. And Lord, help each one of us take a step towards you today. Help us to call on your holy name and change to be more like Jesus. Lord, begin with me. Purge the impurities, out, the impurities out of me. And help me to look more like Jesus tomorrow than I did today. Amen. We are going to close with um, Sing to the King. And in verse 2, it talks about his returning and that we watch and we pray and we need to be ready. And... Um, so it just kind of really goes along with what, what Pastor Charlie was speaking of. We, we need to be ready. We need to do whatever it is on our own personal level to be ready for the return of Jesus. I know I want to be ready. Um, I'm sure you want to be ready as well. Let's stand and sing to the King to close our service today.
the Lord God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. May part of this message leave here with you. May you dwell upon it and think about it. May the Holy Spirit speak into your mind and into your heart. And may you live differently because of the words of Jesus that I tried to talk about and read read this morning. Go in peace with the blessings of God. Amen.